You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. Welcome to Dolphins Talk Weekly, your one-stop audio breakdown of all of this week's Miami Dolphins news. Now, here is your host, Kevin Durr. This episode of Dolphins Talk Weekly is brought to you by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all of the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Just visit Caneswear.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship to you. International fans, too. Caneswear.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Caneswear.com. Caneswear.com. And welcome into another episode of Dolphins Talk Weekly. I am your host, Kevin Dern. Give me a follow on Twitter at KevinMD4. You can follow the show on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Flying solo uh, again today as Evan Morris is off doing cool Navy fighter pilot things. Uh, He actually just completed his final flight in training and is going to his winging ceremony on the 30th. So if you see Evan on Twitter or shoot him a message, send Evan Morris a message uh, congratulating him as he will figure out what he is going to be flying and where he will be stationed in the United States Navy here in just a couple weeks. So congrats, Evan, and hopefully we'll have him back on the show soon. I think the way the schedule will work out is I will have another solo review after the Tampa Bay game coming up next Friday, and then in the week off period between the Tampa Bay game, what would have been the fourth preseason game that weekend and then the regular season starts after that i think evan and i will do a joint show probably reviewing the roster after cutdown day and just kind of giving some general thoughts after the preseason going into the week one regular season as for the whiskey segment tonight uh living in southeast indiana and having grown up in southwest ohio in cincinnati nearly my entire life uh this fall has always hit me hard with allergies and it is ragweed season so no new whiskey review just sipping on a a light glass of peerless rye whiskey from the kentucky peerless distillery um it's pretty good uh get a lot of strong apple flavor in it and charred oak from the the barrel but it's overpriced i think i paid like 109 dollars a bottle I've, i've seen other retail places have it between like 110 and 120 it's not worth that. Uh, you could probably find something else like a, a High West, actually, uh, that I've had. The Campfire, I think, was $75, and it's just as good, if not better. But here's to a Dolphin's victory with Peerless Rye. As the Dolphins beat the Washington Commanders 13-6 to on Friday, and we'll break this one down pretty similarly to how we did the recap over the Falcons just kind of give some general thoughts and then we'll kind of go position by position through the depth chart just to mix it up we'll go defense first this week but I thought overall you saw exactly what you wanted to see out of the first team offense Um, I got some intel from a friend two days before the game that we probably weren't going to see Tyreek and Waddle just because both of them have some minor injuries I think both should be fine you know if there was a real game coming up next week they would be active I don't know that even if they didn't have the injuries I don't know that they would have played on Friday uh, or or excuse me Saturday and even if they did play I think they would have been taken out when Tua was Uh, but you saw exactly what you wanted to see from the first team offense march right down the field Tua five for five made a couple really nice throws the one to Craycraft for a touchdown was excellent and I really liked the one where they did the little reverse drop back 
and he pivoted around and they did that little late release with Julian Hill and Washington had a defender right there you know in years past even last year Tua probably either throws that ball into the ground or eats a sack uh, and then this year he was able to kind of you know off his back foot kind of sidearm it around the defender to Julian Hill who if you watch the rest of that play absolutely thumped one of the commander's defenders uh, gaining some positive yardage there so really impressive with what you see I think there were some tells with that first team just because you had no Hill Waddle OBJ Aaron Brewer's hurt they're holding Teron Armstead out because he doesn't need the reps interesting to me that they went to Kendall Lamb right away as the swing tackle and Lester Cotton as the right guard with Eichenberg shifted over to center I think there's something to be said for that familiarity with the offense and familiarity with Tua both of those guys Lamb and Cotton they both started multiple games last year for the Dolphins so probably a telltale sign that they're in pretty good shape to make the roster uh, I thought it was also good that they got put in some third and fourth down and short situations on that drive. I thought they were pretty intentional not using Alec Ingold as a fullback. He only played two snaps in the game. It was interesting. The third down play, I think everyone's kind of seen Chris Kaufman's you know All-22 cut up on Twitter where Eichenberg got blown up, Johnu Smith got blown up, but then you see them turn around on third on fourth down with Durham Smythe and Julian Hill in the game, and they start moving people. I, I think Julian Hill and Durham Smythe are a really nice tandem. The defense with the ones, or as much as the ones as you could get with the guys that they held out. You know, no Jalen Ramsey, no Javon Holland, uh, no Jordan Poyer, no Jalen Phillips. All the Jays seemingly not in that game. <laughs> No Bradley Chubb, obviously. I thought they looked good. Um, a lot of like softer zone coverage stuff early on. Uh, they set some hard edges in the run game on that first drive, at least. Um, but you kind of saw that deteriorate, and that's one of the big concerns I have for this defense, especially if you're going to play this rotation-heavy style, is what happens when you don't have your best guys on the field all the time. Um, I thought the other takeaway was David Long Jr. and Jordan Brooks looked really nice as a tandem. And then once Long hurt his wrist, uh, I do know that he went to the blue tent and then did come back to the sidelines, which is usually a good thing. Uh, Once David Long went out and they started bringing in like Curtis Bolton and Duke Riley to kind of alternate, you saw some of the middle get exposed there. I don't think those guys are as comfortable playing off the defensive tackles and that kind of a system as long and brooks are and we'll talk about that when we get to the linebacker stuff uh the rest of it kind of looked like a preseason game you know they gave up the big run to jeff driscoll in the first half i think washington had like 92 rushing yards in the first half only ended up with like 111 for the game so you know some good run defense good time of possession by the offense in the second half and I'll tip my cap to Jaquan Burton for stepping in as a five foot nine, hundred seventy seven pound receiver playing like tailback uh, in the second half, just because they didn't want to put Mostert or Achan back in the game. Uh, so tip of the cap to him. But let's start. We'll go defense first this week, and I guess we'll do special teams. Uh, interesting to kind of see how Miami's messed around with both Sanders and Jake Bailey. Uh, Sean Syed, who had a great thread about this on Twitter today, which is Sunday as I record this, both of them kind of hit these low liner kicks and it almost knuckled. Uh, Miami was probably one of the best teams in terms of generating opponent starting field position, uh, whereas some of these other teams are, you know, giving up returns to the 28, 29, 30. I think Miami had nothing past the 25. So, interesting strategy by Danny Crossman, employed by Sanders and Bailey there. Um, I thought Sanders was pretty good. He had the one miss on the long field goal. Uh, I haven't had a chance to go back and rewatch because my two kids were hanging all over Dad uh, as that game was going on. I don't know if the snap or hold was an issue there. Uh, didn't look like it in real time. I think it was just a miss. But, you know, not worried about Jason Sanders, and I think any concern over him is overblown. With Jake Bailey, 
yeah, he's got some bad ones in the chamber that you just kind of have to deal with. It's like that tracer round in a belt of ammo you get. If you get the analogy, you know, you know. Um, I think you look at his ability to not outkick his coverage, and that's pretty good. I think directionally, he's pretty good. It's just those shanks from time to time that come into play that you've got to deal with. Uh, overall, thought the coverage teams were pretty good. Um, you know, no real concerns there. I think Crossman's got a good handle on the kickoff. It's the the punt coverage that was especially alarming to me last year. We'll kind of get real a real idea of that once we get into the regular season because you don't know what these lineups are going to be on special teams as we move forward. So we'll go ahead and start with the defense. We'll start with the interior defensive line. Uh, after a pretty impressive showing last week, a uh, little bit to be desired here in the first half. You gave up you know, a big run around the edge to Jaden Daniels. He gave up a big scramble opportunity to Jeff Driscoll. Um, I think Calais Campbell and Zach Sealer were solid, not great. I don't know that they're ever going to be salt and pepper the way Sealer and Wilkins were. Um, but it might be serviceable. Uh, the rest of it, I think last week you sort of had like the box, box and whisker plot where certain guys like Deshaun Hand and Neville Gallimore and Leonard Payne kind of really stood out. Uh, I think this week you kind of got that rejiggered, and there's really, beyond Sealer and Campbell, nobody stood out where I'm like, okay, you you have to have this guy on the roster. The other thing, you know, I, I thought Hand and Pilly didn't really do much. Gallimore was okay. What I'm really curious about, though, is how they've been aligning in this nickel set. They're essentially running the wide nine, which is a wide five technique, a two eye a three technique and a nine across the front what they've been doing and this is something that baltimore's done in the past is instead of having a two eye where you're forcing two players to two gap or play a gap and a half like fangio did where you're reading and reacting they take that nose tackle body type and make them play as a true shade which is a one technique benito jones would be the guy the ideal guy to do that uh, but you're also forcing a linebacker to have more coverage area and probably, if you don't execute it correctly up front, you're having a linebacker get taken on one-on-one right off the snap. So I think that's something that David Long and Jordan Brooks are both comfortable with. I don't know anyone else on the roster who actually played. because Anthony Walker did not play again. Anyone else on the roster who didn't play, I don't know that you'd be super comfortable with those guys doing that. So it's not a real surprise that the Dolphins have sort of, you know, they got rid of Tier Tart and McDaniel kind of cited some scheme fit issues that way. Uh, if you look at him going laterally, he wasn't that great of a player. Um, I think that's something that Miami wants to do and implement. They brought in Robert Cooper from Florida State, who's a big nose tackle. And then they also worked out two absolute behemoths on Thursday. Uh, former Cincinnati Bengals fourth rounder Tyler Shelvin and then former Seattle Seahawk Brian Moan um, both of whom are you know 340 biscuits and above so it clearly seems like they're trying to identify this body type and at least have if not two guys on the roster at least have one guy on the practice squad that you could call up if needed um, after an impressive outing in week one in the preseason I don't think Brandon Pilly did much to really say like okay you know you can change his name on the roster from pencil to pen uh just didn't see much there so i uh, i would say this week you don't need to see Ke- see campbell and sealer anymore but i think the rest of the guys probably all need to dress and get some work in uh as far as the edge defenders the outside linebackers I'll call them edge defenders because you're really kind of seeing them play as an outside linebacker and as a defensive end, depending on the the schematic formation and the player body type. I thought Mo Kamara's use was probably the most interesting thing out of all these guys because he actually got snaps early and they were not afraid to drop him in coverage. Uh, Nate Tice has a great thread on Twitter that shows some of the Dolphins stuff they did and how they disguise some of their fire zones 
there's a pressure play where they bring Elijah Campbell, who was playing as a box safety from the strong side, and they drop Mo Camara into the hook, and he plays hook to curl on that backside zone, which those are two different things. Uh, just for those wanting the terminology there, the hook is to the inside, the curls to the outside. Played that and really kind of did a nice job of kind of reading number two and making sure that they didn't throw that way. It ended up being a deep pass where they had cloud coverage over, I forget the outside receiver, but basically Cam Smith played underneath and then they had Marcus May over the top and Jaden Daniels overthrew everybody out of bounds because he got the pressure in his face. Uh, so interesting stuff from Mo Kamara there. I thought he did a really nice job of setting the edge. I think of all the edge defenders, he was probably the best and most consistent at it in the game, which it's preseason week two doesn't tell you a whole lot, but I think we all kind of thought he might be further along in that area than Chop Robinson would be like from day one. I think that played out. Uh, Emmanuel Ogba, you know, had some nice moments in the game, except for the one, I believe he was on the field on the one Jaden Daniels 12 yard run around that side really was a good edge setter from 2020 through 2022. I know a season got cut short in 22 because of the, was it the bicep or tricep injury, but he really set hard edges. And then last year in Fangio system, when they made him as a stand up edge guy, it kind of fell off a little bit. You'd like to see him get a little bit better and set harder edges, especially now that he's allowed to come out of his DN stance and do that. But I think that kind of shows you some of the beauty of this scheme and the flexibility of it. Uh, Chop Robinson, a little bit all over. Um, you saw the burst. You saw his ability to backdoor a blocker one-on-one -on -one to make a huge run stop. Uh, you can definitely see him flatten and chase run plays from behind. Jalen Phillips is really good at this. Jason Phillips is also, or Jalen Phillips was also really good at uh, backdooring plays coming out of college at the U. I think the the issue here is you know Chop isn't as big or as strong as Jalen Phillips, and just hasn't mastered the handwork part coming out the way Phillips had. So you're going to see him have to to adjust that. But I I think you saw a good burst. You saw the ability to play both sides in the rush game. You saw them kind of stand him up at times and rush over the interior. All stuff we're going to see in the regular season. So I think for me, it's just he's going to have a little bit of a learning curve. I think he's going to have a little bit more feast or famine in terms of his like player arc as a rookie, whereas maybe Mo Kamara is more consistent. I think you're going to see some massive plays from Chop. I think you're going to see some plays where he maybe tries to backdoor something and you give up a big run around the edge or – you know, he rushes too far upfield against bigger tackles, which is something that, you know, used to kind of plague Cam Wake uh, at times. Similar body type, similar type of player. So just interesting note to watch. And I'll, I'll give a, a shout out here to Chris Kaufman on Twitter at CK Parrot. Really kind of pointed out there's a certain dichotomy and how they want to use these edge guys. You have guys that are true, like, three four style outside linebackers that can stand up and play on the edge i think at least right now without bradley chubb playing because he would fall into this category as well you've got three with jalen phillips mo kamara and quentin bell who can all kind of stand up and do some of those outside linebacker things and drop in coverage and you've got two guys emmanuel ogba and chop robinson who you probably just want to be in a three or four point stance rushing off a tackle and setting a hard edge instead of dropping into coverage. Uh, I think Chubb is kind of unique because he can do a little bit of both and he can rush from the right side, which I feel like is getting to be a little bit more of a rare thing. You see a lot of these college teams putting their best rushers over right tackles. So the defense is left. Um, but with Phillips and Chubb, you can have them play both up and down. I, I think you'll see some roles kind of carved out. I think you're clearly at a point where, at least for me, like Quentin Bell, a lot of that preseason hype kind of kind of smells like the Mitchell Agude stuff from last year where you hear it all about it in, in practice and in these non-padded things, and then when the game comes on, it just disappears. You know, Quentin Bell, I thought, had some nice reps setting the edge, 
you know, got involved in a couple of run stops, but, you know, in terms of being a pass rusher, he's of the five guys you'd have on the roster right now, he's probably fifth. And he's probably the guy that you would move when Bradley Chubb comes back. Um, off ball linebackers, like as I mentioned, David Long Jr., Jordan Brooks, you can really see the how and the why they're going to be good fits in this defense. Sort of similar to the Roquan Smith, Patrick Queen stuff that ran in Baltimore the last two years under Mike McDonald. Uh, You have to hope Anthony Walker Jr. gets healthy. You'd like to see him get some reps in this third preseason game and be ready for the regular season because after those three, it's kind of the Wild West. And if you only have those two, and David Long got dinged up in the game, uh, wasn't super impressed by anybody. You know, Duke Riley didn't have a great game. Uh, I thought it was telling that they played Curtis Bolton as early as they did when David Long went out. Uh, he probably impressed me the most out of anybody. Uh, Channing Tindall would have been second for, on that list for me. Um, I, I think with Zeke Vandenberg, you're kind of just seeing a player kind of slip. I, I think he's probably playing for someone else's roster at this point or for a practice squad spot. I just don't see him making it. You know, again, kind of like the Mitchell Lagude thing, a lot of good stuff about Zeke in the practice sessions that you hear about. Not so much when it counts. And not that these games count, but it's an actual football game and not a practice. Um, Very interested to see what they do now that Cam Brown, who was kind of the special teams like designated linebacker, now that he's out for the year, as well as Grayson Murphy, do they keep a fifth off-ball guy? Like, does that... Does Channing Tindall's athleticism and his blitz ability... And he does kind of have some natural pass rush ability. If you go back and watch his tape at Georgia, he was comfortable as an edge backer. Does that kind of save him? Or do you keep someone like Curtis Bolton who undersized but can kind of fly around in the middle? Uh, I'll be interested to see what they do at the off-ball linebacker position for final cuts. Cornerback probably have the best undrafted depth on the team at any position from here. Um you know, uh, let's start with. I thought Kendall Fuller was okay. I I think depending on how they use him, you could see him kind of had of a, a little bit of a renaissance. He had a down year last year with Washington, but I see the intrigue. Um, but man, Cam Smith looked pretty impressive in coverage. He had the one missed tackle on Terry McLaurin's long catch and run. But I, I like the way he keeps everything in front of him. He made all the other tackles. He did a great job on the deep ball. You know, he was able to use his hands well enough. Did the chicken, the chicken wing technique, and didn't get called, and had a PBU. Impressive night for him. It's a shame that he pulled a hammy on special teams. That's his bugaboo: is confidence and staying healthy. Uh, you would love to see him kind of get work and, and be a starter air quotes there in the last preseason game um thought he had a big night um but then you would look at the it was interesting that they used nick needham as sort of a slot safety early in the game so maybe they're a little higher on him than meets the eye but if you told me that like storm duck would make the team over ethan bonner wouldn't really bat an eye I, i think he's had a great preseason uh I've been impressed with Isaiah Johnson. He had the one play last night where he tried to go for the pick and missed and gave up the big gain. And then Jason Matry does pretty well against the run as a slot guy. So I I would think you'd probably try and keep out of those four between Bonner, Matry, Duck, and Johnson, you'd probably want to try and keep three of those guys in total on your practice squad and roster. I think if you... You know Ethan Bonner or Storm Duck, if you try and cut them and push them through waivers to the practice squad, I think those guys would probably get claimed right off the bat just because of that talent level. Um, but Storm Duck just seems to be impressive in coverage. Uh, really like what I've seen from him. At safety, uh, Marcus May was much more impressed with him as a middle-of-the-field safety type of player. So if you do go three safety looks in the game which was kind of a Baltimore staple last year. 
I felt a lot more comfortable with him last night. You know, he was in good position on that deep throw that Jaden Daniels overthrew on the cloud coverage play. I think that was to Terry McLaurin and Jaden Daniels' second drive. Uh, his range from deep as a run support safety from middle of the field looks was pretty good. Uh, so I, I would feel more comfortable, and I think he's probably more ahead of Patrick McMorris than maybe we as fan bases and especially myself realized after week one. He looked much more comfortable with everything against the Commanders than he did against the Falcons, was in better spots against the Commanders than he was with the Falcons. So to me, I think if you have Marcus May and Javon Holland, you've got at least two guys who are comfortable playing middle of the field free safety. I would not want Jordan Poyer having to do that. He's much better closer to the line of scrimmage. And I think if you have two middle of the field safety types, you can do that stuff. So impressive with him. Uh, Elijah Campbell's really improved to the point where, like, I used to be pretty nervous if he had to go in and play defense, whereas now I'd be like, okay, you know, he's the next man up. Like, uh, I'm fine with it. Uh, really intrigued with his speed and what you could do with some of the blitzes that they showed. Was really impressed that they tried to show some deep blitzes from the safety looks. Uh, that's something we really haven't seen a ton of. I think really kind of the last guy we, I remember that with was like Rashad Jones in the Kevin Coyle, Vance Joseph, Matt Burke type of era. Uh, but beyond that, nothing. I, I think the other thing that's coming that they haven't shown yet, that we really haven't seen, I think Patrick Sertan was really good at this back in the early 2000s, was a corner blitz from the perimeter like to the field side. I think you may see some some crazy things like that at times from Jalen Ramsey. So just something to keep an eye on. So overall, you know, defense did, didn't look as good cohesive as they did against Atlanta was wasn't impressed with kind of the middle of the defense most of the night you know D tackles and linebackers uh, some of that was I, I think Anthony Weaver purposely trying to blitz and see what you have in some situations that felt a little more blitz happy especially against a no huddle style offense than what you would do in the regular season so there's something there that they're trying to identify in terms of of which guys have good timing, which guys have that speed and athletic ability to be effective blitzers when you're not on the line of scrimmage all the time. Also interesting to see how they did like some of the inserted looks and some of the mugged up looks with the linebackers and how they dropped guys into coverage. Uh, this really does feel like the actual Baltimore playbook and not not at least not yet not a ton of like the Romeo Cornell influence stuff other than maybe like some of your three four alignments but they really haven't shown that in any of the preseason games so far so not great but like encouraging overall through two games from what we've seen from the starting defense I think the picture gets clearer once you have some of the the starters and the secondary back in there so interested to see what they do next week since you haven't gotten work for Jalen Ramsey, Javon Holland, Jordan Poyer in this preseason yet. Switching gears back to the offense, and we'll do this kind of in reverse order. We'll, we'll finish with quarterback because there's kind of a finishing point I want to make there. Offensive line, I mentioned this at the top of the show, Kendall Lamb sort of seems to have the lead as the swing tackle. He played left tackle, not Patrick Paul, but Kendall Lamb played left tackle for Tua's drive. Lester Cotton played right guard for Tua's drive. Both those guys did fine jobs and kind of got off the field after that. So, to me, I, I think if I'm making the roster and barring any injuries in the next, you know, three weeks... These are the guys I think you can start to put in pen. I think you have four starting spots solidified. You know, Armstead at left tackle, Rob Jones at left guard, Aaron Brewer at center, Austin Jackson at right tackle. I think you have kind of the rest of your nine solidified. I think one of the two between Liam Eichenberg and Jack Driscoll is going to be your right guard. The other guy kind of slots in as your backup center slash guard. Obviously, Patrick Paul is going to be on the team. Kendall Lamb 
is on the team. And I think Lester Cotton gets a spot as like a true guard type player, although he has cross-trained at center in the past with the Dolphins. So that to me feels like the nine, just kind of which order you put the right guard battle in. Still seems unsettled. If you ever get Isaiah Wynn back, he's probably the next guy. Otherwise, it would be Sean Harlow, depending on what happened on the injury. You know, he got rolled up pretty good on the one awful rep and pass pro you saw from Patrick Paul in the night where he got beat to the inside, had no help because Jaquan Burton had released. And then, you know, the defender sacked, uh, I guess it was Mike White at the time, forced the fumble. And kind of that carnage rolled into Sean Harlow, who was at right guard this week instead of left guard. Uh, he'd probably be the next guy to me after those, after win. Um, that's kind of it. A, a little intrigued with Matthew Jones, the Ohio State kid, but he feels like a practice squad guy right off the bat. Uh, but I do want to talk about Patrick Paul. Um you know, well, let's rewind real quick. We'll go back to the starters. I thought the interior actually did okay. You know, Lester Cotton impressed me more than Jones and Eichenberg. As I mentioned, C.K. Parrott has the the clip of Eichenberg getting a swim move put on him on the third and one play, and then Johnny Smith just gets obliterated on the backside where those guys combine for a tackle of Mostert. He can't get any push on the pile. But then you see Eichenberg redeem himself on fourth down they get nice push from Julian Hill and Durham Smythe. And you've also seen, and Nate Tice pointed this out in the thread, they use some of that little quick cheat motion with Julian Hill and Durham Smythe to get them better angles on some of their counter and trap plays that they're running out of guns. So uh, McDaniel and Frank Smith definitely in their bag early and trying to experiment with some of that stuff that you may not normally see a tight end do. Um, check out Nate Tice's thread if you want to see what I mean there uh, but he also has a thread on Patrick Paul and you watch the reps like for someone who's 6'7 332 the guy moves in space incredibly well there's a sort of that crack toss play that Miami does where Patrick Paul pulls and just kind of the easy athletic ability he has to go pick off a safety on that play you know it's about eight nine yards downfield and then he turns them horizontally and pushes them all the way out of to the sideline like it's it's pretty incredible what happens when he gets his hands on you in space and locks on um he is the opposite of isaac asiata from way back in the day uh in terms of playing in space and then nate tice also has a nice thread that shows like here's what happens when patrick paul gets his hands right his pass protection looks pretty good. He's so big and long and strong. You know, that Twitter clip of Mike McDaniel saying, hey, put your hand on my forehead. I can't reach you. That's pretty evident how long he is. When he gets his hands right, it's really good. I think the biggest issue is him giving up his post leg, his inside leg, and letting guys cross face. We saw that happen, I think, two or three times in the Falcons game. But he's got such long arms and such incredible strength that he's able to kind of latch those guys and at least kind of steer them in front of the quarterback out of harm's way. Whereas in the game against the commanders, they slid the protection away from him. And there's just a gap there between he and I think it was Chase and Hines at the time uh, where this commander's defender just goes in untouched for a sack. Um, you can't have that. But as I, I pointed out within the Nate Tice thread, like it's easy to see why like McDaniel and Frank Smith and Butch Berry would be so intrigued with this kid. Like, yes, his footwork needs work. It gets wonky. We kind of knew that would happen, but man, when he gets it right, it looks easy for him when he gets it right. That's the caveat. He's got to be, more consistent with the footwork he's got to be more consistent with the hand placement but if he can do that this kid's going to be pretty good i think uh at tight end this is kind of the one position where i'm like okay you've got these three guys durham smythe johnny smith julian hill put it in pen put it in permanent marker double underline it i don't think anyone else is getting to the roster like jody fortson you know 
Tanner Connor, you don't make the club from the tub, as they say. Hayden Rucci, you love the blocking ability, but he just, he just doesn't offer you anything in the passing game. I would say he's a nice player to have on the practice squad if you need an extra blocker. And speaking of extra blockers, if you want to use Patrick Paul as an extra body, as like a big tight end, as a six lineman in the run game, you should do it. Um, really impressed with this, the blocks that Julian Hill and Durham Smythe had, especially on the fourth down conversion. And then, you know, I hate to bring up this name and this team, but Jonu Smith used to play for New England before he was with Atlanta. There was another tight end kind of similarly built named Aaron Hernandez, you know, who played in New England, who they did some of those little, you know, inside handoff, the little shovel passes, like a tight end end around stuff with that I think we're going to see Johnny Smith do. And, you know, (laughs) cough, cough, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I think there's a a low red zone package with Johnny Smith's name on it uh, where you're going to see some of that stuff employed in goal-to-go situations this year. So something else to keep an eye on. But those three guys feel like you should all have them on the team. If it were me and you got everyone else healthy, I wouldn't play any of those three guys in the game next Friday. Just play Fortson, Connor, Rucci. Let them duke it out for a practice squad spot. Receiver. I I had gotten some intel. Like I knew Hill and Waddle weren't going to play. They're both dealing with some minor stuff. Not to worry. If there's a regular season game next week, they're playing in that. Like uh, That's the way I would look at it. Big week for Odell Beckham Jr. You'd like to see him get some run in the offense in the preseason, get like a drive. Uh, doubt they would play Tua again next Friday, but maybe they want another look at the starters. I don't know. But you'd like to see OBJ at least start practicing to get some reps. I think this is a big week for him. If he doesn't practice, then maybe you run the risk of him starting the season on PUP. I think if that's the case, River Craycraft is probably the third receiver. Uh, He's had a tremendous camp. We know he's dependable. He's the best blocking receiver on the team. He's got great hands. Just not the athlete that everyone else is. But I think he's clearly on the roster. Uh, Malik Washington. I think is also clearly on the roster. And I know people are going to be like, well, he didn't have a big game catching the ball. And he had the drop on the one deep ball from Skylar Thompson, which that was a pretty good throw. Uh, Where I think people need to watch Malik Washington is in his blocking. He's willing to do it. He's good at it. He's probably the best one on the roster right now, other than River Craycraft at blocking downfield. Yes, better than Berrios. Um, I've liked what he's done on some of the returns, uh, you know, lost some ground on one of them, but, you know, as someone who holds their high school's school record for worst punt return, I, I kind of get the why there, maybe a little more than some folks just trying to make something happen. By the way, mine was minus 28 yards. Uh, we'll talk about that on another episode, but anyway, uh, Malik, I think has got to learn some route running. That was kind of a a known thing that we were going to worry about, just given on the, just given the offenses he was in, in college at Northwestern in Virginia, good route runner, but ran a very limited route tree, kind of similar to Eric Azukama. Um, There's going to be a learning curve for Malik, but I think right now, you know, assuming good health, the five wide receivers I would keep and write in pen would be Hill, Waddle, OBJ, Craycraft and Malik Washington. Uh, Braxton Berrios just was never that excited for him last year. Just never outside of that Chargers game in week one. Just never did much. You know, had some decent returns here and there, but that was kind of it. You know, I know the ball got tipped right in front of him on Friday on Skylar Thompson's throw, but, you know, that's one you need to catch if you're going to be, you know, a contributor on the team. Um, didn't really seem like he had any more juice in the return game than Malik did. Maybe just more consistent and kind of knows, you know, when to try something and when not to. And Malik being a rookie doesn't know that yet at the NFL level. Um, but I think Berrios is probably still on the bubble in my book. Um, 
And I think there's something to be said for that blocking role. You know, that's something that Craycraft and Cedric Wilson kind of got into last year. Uh, McDaniel loves to have those matchups benefit the run guys. You know, read, uh, again, hat tip to Chris Kaufman, read his thread on Twitter about that. I think Malik Washington fits that bill better than Ezukama and Berrios at this point. And I think outside of Berrios on the bubble, I think of all the other bubble guys, Eric Azukama is clearly the best of the rest. You know, Braylon Sanders had a pretty rough night other than the one nice catch he had. And none of the other guys, you know, really have much juice, I don't think. Um, you know, Anthony Schwartz kind of in the same spot as Eric Azukama is now. Like, you've heard about him in camp. We know he's fast, but he, you can't make the club from the tub. It's probably a big week for him in that regard to try and steal the sixth spot if they keep a sixth receiver because now that you have Johnny Smith and Devon Achan playing those roles and being more involved in the pass game, do you actually keep a sixth receiver? Um, so I think Erica Zucama needs a pretty big week again this week against Tampa to, you know, make the coaches at least think, you know, I'd certainly think you'd want him back on a practice squad. I don't know that you get him back on a practice squad if you cut him and try and push him through waivers. Uh, at running back, Mostert and Achan look regular season ready. You know, I, I even said that about Jalen Wright after the first game. Those three guys, I wouldn't play them against Tampa Bay. Give all the reps to Savon Ahmed. You want to see something out of him. Give Chris Brooks reps. Give Jeff Wilson Jr. reps. Don't play the first three. Um, and again, credit to Jaquan Burton for stepping up. Uh, and playing running back, he got smacked around like three or four times and just kept doing it despite not knowing how to run any of the plays as a running back. So credit to him. Chris Brooks has looked good. He'd be my fourth guy uh, on that list. I think with the hit he took, it's got to be a concussion or a stinger, the way they escorted him off the field. Yeah, I don't have any intel on that yet. Um, but he seems more impressive than, than Jeff Wilson Jr. so far this preseason. Uh, and, and again, you know, Savan Ahmed, he's been a fun player over the years. He's like a cockroach that doesn't go away, but you can't make the club from the tub. I think that's kind of the, the issue there. Uh, and finally, quarterback, you know, Tua, Us, number one, whatever you want to call him. You saw what you, exactly what you wanted to see from him. I remember like all the preseasons we had, you know, like Ryan Tannehill in the first offense and you wouldn't get that kind of a drive. That's exactly what you want to see from a guy who's making $53 million a year and just signed the big contract. Got guys lined up. You didn't have any dumb penalties. You didn't have motion stuff. And that's without Hill and Waddle, without Teron Armstead, without Aaron Brewer. And you just march right down the field. You get conversions. I talked about the nifty play where he threw around the defender was an excellent fade ball to River Craycraft for a touchdown. You can walk out and hand it to him in a better spot. I don't think you need to see Tua play against Tampa Bay unless you're starting like the full offense and you want to give them, you know, a series. But I wouldn't I wouldn't risk anything at this point. He's regular season ready. The big thing I want to talk about is is backup quarterback. Again, both Mike White and Skylar Thompson were better against the Commanders than they were against the Falcons. You kind of expected that. Skylar was more effective. I think it's pretty telling now through two games they've played him ahead of Mike White. Um, but I know like, there's a lot of fans clamoring for like Ryan Tannehill all of a sudden, or why is our backup quarterback situation so bad? And I would say go watch other preseason games and see some of the quarterbacks around the league. Like if if at any point in any team in the regular season loses their quarterback for five weeks or more, your season's probably about shot. Like the only circumstances those are going to be good is if you're a team like Atlanta where you've drafted a guy who's in waiting you know, to be the guy or new England, if they start Jacoby Brissett and he gets hurt, you can see Drake may play like Miami's obviously not in that situation. And you have Skylar Thompson in the third year in this offense. You saw him make some pretty nice throws. Uh, it didn't 
help that he had some bad drops. You know, Malik Washington had the one on the deep ball. Braxton Berrios had the nice throw that Skylar Thompson made on the run in the end zone. Got deflected at the last second, but hit Berrios right in the number zero. Like, that's got to be a touchdown catch. Uh, and there, there was one more drop. I can't remember who it was. You also saw him try and fit a tight window to Hayden Rucci that got deflected on a nice play by the defensive back. Like, I think Skyler was 8 out of 15. Very easily could have been 11 or 12 out of 15 for about a buck 50 in a score. Uh, that probably changes a lot of people's opinions of how he played on Friday or Saturday, excuse me. You also have to remember that, like, in this offense, and, and Kyle Krabs had this quote on his show from Tom Moore, who was the longtime offensive coordinator for the Indianapolis Colts when they had Peyton Manning. I'll paraphrase it because I don't remember it offhand and I don't have the clip handy from Kyle's show, but it's essentially Tom Moore saying, like, we tailor this offense to Peyton Manning's strengths. Like, if he's not in there, it's going to look like shit and we don't coach shit. Like, this offense, while somewhat ubiquitous throughout the league, you know, obviously the 49ers run it, Miami's running it, the Rams run it. You see offshoots of it in Green Bay, in Houston, in Cincinnati. Um, it's pretty prevalent. But I don't think any one of those offenses is tailored more to their quarterback than what Mike McDaniel has done with Tua. And a lot of what makes Tua really, really good is stuff that – Tyler Skylar Thompson doesn't really have in his bag. Like two is able to throw off the back foot of a three step drop. He's able to throw off the back foot of a five step drop. He's able to read one, two progressions really, really quickly. He gets the ball out faster than any quarterback in the league. You know, he can do it with a high average depth of target second in the league last year, only behind Derek Carr, who's chucking up deep balls left and right that don't go anywhere. Um, Skylar Thompson's not that, you know, he's got to do a hitch step off a three and a five step drop, you know, with Tua, there's a lot of stuff they build into the offense where there's some kind of action, whether it's a run action, whether it's RPO, whether it's true drop back play action stuff that are built onto these passes. You're not going to show that in a preseason game. So Skylar Thompson's got to sit there in sort of a true drop back setting when you don't get that many reps to do it in practice. So I think there's a lot of variables to consider here. Not that I'm saying like Skylar Thompson is great, but I'm saying Skylar Thompson, if you need to win a game or two, can come in and, and win a game or two. He's proven that. He beat the Jets as a rookie, which is a pretty damn good defense that year, to get Miami into the playoffs. He played pretty well against Buffalo in a playoff game and had a chance on the last drive to come down there and possibly send it to overtime or win the game. And a McDaniel, you know, time management blunder cost him the chance. So I think sort of the rush to judgment here is either people trying to be funny on Twitter or they just don't have kind of the context knowledge that they need to have in order to make those rush to judgments. But I think it's pretty clear that Skyler has outplayed Mike White. Um, to this point, both based off of practice and what we've seen in the two preseason games. Um, I think to be fair to Mike White, you probably want to give him some reps with the same cast that you've seen Skylar Thompson with in some game action. Uh, but it's not going to surprise me one bit if you end up with just two quarterbacks on the roster and Skylar Thompson is one of them, along with Tua, and then they end up with another third quarterback on the practice squad. Just remember the rule this year. Um, you know, I think with Skyler, the big thing is you need to see him kind of stand in the pocket a little bit and not bail so quick. You know, he's really good on the run and can make some big throws on the run, but his processing speed is, is what kind of kills you. Like Tua is high speed Wi-Fi. Skylar Thompson's, you know, kind of just now exiting his AOL dial up phase. Like he's, he's in the next progression of it, but you're still a couple levels below to it. Obviously that's a high speed internet joke for folks, but you know, neither of those guys got helped by some bad drops. We saw some nice throws from both of them. Um, I think the situation is nowhere near as bad as a lot of dolphins. Twitter is making it out to be. And I don't necessarily think Ryan Tannehill would be a great fit in this offense. So that's something to consider as well. But enough of me rambling on about it. That's going to do it 
for this game. As I said before, we'll do a show solo after the Tampa Bay game, reviewing that. Evan and I will be doing a show on the off week between the final preseason game and the start of the regular season, since there's that extra week, because there is no fourth preseason game anymore. You can follow the show on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, Podbean, wherever else you get your podcasts. That's going to do it for me. Have a great week, everybody, and fins up. And this episode of Dolphins Talk was brought to you by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Hurricanes, the Florida Panthers, and all of the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Visit Caneswear.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship it right to you. International fans, too. Caneswear.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Caneswear.com. Caneswear.com.